Good morning. Our reading today comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more, and I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the word of God this morning. You may be seated. Well, top of the morning, everybody. How are we doing? Excellent. Well rested from spring break. Totally exhausted from spring break. Somewhere in between. Glad that you're here today. Uh, any students here? Couple, very good. Usually they don't get up until double digits on the clock. So anyway, good to have you here. Um, my name is Greg. I'm one of the guys here at the church. Um, if you're new here, just want to catch you up with where we've been. We've been going through the book of Philippians, and we're just about ready to finish this, punch it over the goal line here. Um, the theme in this book in Philippians has been identity. Uh, as we go from chapter one all the way through the end, Paul is consistently revealing reiterating this whole issue about who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, and then how that has practical um, applications into all sorts of um, areas of our life. Last week, Jason um, was in the first part of chapter four, talked about uh, anxiety. The week before that, there was the issue of conflict, and I know that very, very few of us deal with the issues of conflict or anxiety, but anyway, they were great messages. But the whole idea is that Christ and our identification with Christ, with our relationship that we can have with Christ, that there brings all sorts of practical applications for something that comes out wholesome, good, beneficial, and a blessing to others and fulfillment to ourselves. We're going to move on, and we're going to go um, into another section of chapter 4. And what we're going to be talking about this morning is issues of looking for opportunities, seeking contentment, and being able to reach out to others. So we're going to go ahead. Um, at the end of um, Jason's message last week, he ended with this verse, and it really is a great segue into what we're going to be talking about in this next series of passages. Paul writes this, as for the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace shall be with you. Uh, who's up for a little peace this morning? Can I get an amen? That's right. Um, uh, the world is in really turmoil, not only abroad, but also here. Um, Romans says that even all of creation is cursed because of sin. We live in a broken, broken creation. We are broken people in that creation. Christ came. Um, he has paid for the penalty of our sin, one day he will come back to rule and reign and this creation will no longer be broken, but it will be fully restored. Until that time, here we are. And so what we want to talk about today has to deal with, in part, how do we get some of that peace? How can we get some of that peace? Well, as we can see, Paul says this to the, Thess or to the, the Philippians, he goes, look, the things that you have learned from me. 
He spent time there. He taught them the things that you have learned, the things that you have received, those things that you have even heard and you've also witnessed in my own life. All of these things, this whole compilation of their experiences with Paul while he was there. He says, practice these things. Practice these things and that the God of peace will be with you. You see, God, for the, for the Christian, God is with us because of what Christ has done. But the experience of this peace that God offers, it comes with a condition. He says, I want you to practice these things, these things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Do these things, practice these things, and this God of peace will be with you. Strong's Concordance defines this, this word peace, speaking specifically of the Messiah's peace, Christ. He goes, the way that leads to salvation, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is. In essence, this peace is saying that there was once enmity between God and ourselves, and when we have pledged our allegiance, we have asked for forgiveness for our brokenness and our sin and our hopeless state through Christ, that we now have peace with God our Father. But it's also, he said, one of the other manifestations that he goes, and we will then be content with whatever earthly lot we find ourselves in. Contentment is a very, very foreign um, place to be in in our, in our society, in our culture. We have become and grown into a very discontent and a very dissatisfied people. And peace is something that the world longs for, but yet few can experience. And yet Paul said, you know, this peace can be with you, but he said, you know, there are things that must be practiced first. The word practice there can also be translated as exercise. How many people love to exercise? Both of you? Good. Yeah. If we want to have the benefits of exercise, it's something that we have to do continually, continuously. If we want the benefits of better health, um, weight loss, uh, better cardiovascular ability, uh, increased strength, whatever it is, it's something that we can't do once in a while. We have to do it on an ongoing basis. The verb tense for practice has, has the same idea. It's something that we have to do continuously in order to reap the benefits of that. You see, peace is something that we can experience internally. Again, we will not really experience total peace until Christ comes back, and he will. But we have the opportunity to experience internal peace. But there are some things that we need to practice. Just like the Apostle Paul said, biblical truth that he gave to these people, that he lived in their presence, that he spoke, that he taught, these things that they learned, that they saw, that they heard, these things, biblical truth, are the things that when practiced, they will lead to inner peace. So he goes on, he goes, but I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked an opportunity to act. As we will get farther along in this passage this morning, we will find out that what this church did, these people, is that they uh, a couple times had raised money as a gift offering for Paul as he went on his um, missionary journeys. And he said, you know, it's one thing, he goes, you, you were concerned, and your concern was even revived for me, but he goes, you now had an opportunity to act and to do something. Being concerned is a sign that your heart is really open to something. Being concerned is having empathy. It's focusing on something. Maybe it's an issue, a problem, something that needs to be done, a problem that needs a solution. Being concerned, maybe it's things that you're praying about. Being concerned is good, but when you have an opportunity to act, now you're doing something. So I just want to ask you, and you don't have to answer this. This is something I want you to contemplate for yourself. What concerns you right now? 
what are the things that are concerning you? It might not be the things that concern the person in front of you or behind you or at work. It might not even be some of the things that concern your spouse. What concerns you right now? Specifically. What are you spending time praying about right now? What are the things that you find yourself, you prayed about maybe this morning or maybe last week or it's something that you're concerned about and you're gonna be spending some time praying about it even tomorrow? But what might happen if you prayed for an opportunity to act? What if we as God's people, if we would start taking our concerns and the things that burden us, and while praying for those things is good and it is beneficial, what if we would also say, God, concerning these things that you're burdening my heart with, the things that I see, the problems, the struggles, whatever it is, Lord, in this, would you give me an opportunity now to act what might happen? What might happen to you in your relationship with the Lord if on a daily basis you're praying for an opportunity to act? I really believe that when we look through the, the, the ins and outs of Scripture that Christianity, faith in Christ, is a full contact sport. It is not something that is reserved for just reading, just listening, but it involves one-on-one, one-on-some, one-on-many, many-on-one, whatever it is, but it is people contact that really takes opportunities and brings them to something that is powerful and influential. Paul goes on, he goes, I, not that I speak from need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now, if we're familiar with Paul in the New Testament, Paul, you know, um, when, he, when he first started out, when we read about him in chapter two in this book, um, Paul was an all-star. I mean, in his own mind, Paul was an all-star. You know, before he met Christ, it's like he had a list of accolades that really went long and deep. You know, he said, he goes, look, I'm, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, you know, as to the law, no strikes, man. I was found blameless. I mean, he really had it all. He was part of the elite. He was well known in his circles. You know, he, he was a mover and a shaker when it came to the religious circles. But then he found Christ. And when we saw when Christ sent him on various missionary journeys to the Gentiles to share the news about Jesus Christ, then we also read, well, he was shipwrecked, uh, he was imprisoned, he was left for dead, he was beaten almost to the point of death, he was left sick, he was run out of town. Um, not a very good situation. But yet when Paul, is he's summarizing, he goes, look, I'm not speaking from a place of want or need. Paul is saying, when I, when I look upon my lot, I do not look as my, uh, myself as being someone who is needy or in want. In fact, he goes, I've learned to be content. The word content from the Greek word has says sufficient for oneself, strong enough or possessing enough to need no aid or support, independent of external circumstances. As I said in the first service this morning, if I were to... Um, be talking about this particular issue and gave this kind of a definition to a secular business crowd, they'd probably go, preach that, brother. Independent, self-sufficient, strong. I don't need anything. Almost sounds like you said, I don't need anybody or anything. I got this. But since we're in church, our fannies squirm a little bit because that doesn't, something ain't right here. Something ain't right here. I don't need anything from anybody. I am totally independent of external circumstances. Well, who does Paul think he is? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because now we can go on. See, Paul says, I've learned to be content. All these things that we've read, strong enough, I have enough, I'm independent. 
I have learned to be content to have that manifestation in whatever circumstance I am. In whatever circumstance I am. Now, I don't know about you. It's inspired scripture, yes, but that seems like a pretty jumbled sentence. Whatever circumstance I am, doesn't that seem like it doesn't quite roll off the tongue well? Well, that phrase, whatever circumstances, comes from just one word in the Greek, the Greek word hos, which means really who, which, whose, or what. And it can also be translated as this, I have learned to be content in who I am or whose I am. See, the strength of who we are is really dependent upon whose we are. It's that issue of identity that's been rolling through the book of Philippians week after week as we've been looking into it. Who we are is a direct manifestation, a direct result of who we claim our identity to or with. It's whose we are. And so if I were to ask you again, whose are you? Whose are you? Who is your allegiance to? If you're one that says, well, look, um, really, my allegiance is to me. My allegiance is to me. And as we unfold, it's like, look, um, as the great theologian, prophet, and philosopher, Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? Because there are many, there are many, there are many here, there are many up here who had that, who had that viewpoint for years, for decades of my life. Whose am I? I am mine. And, what ha- and we, will, we will see what happens. Maybe you've experienced what happens. Those of us who are in Christ, those of us who claimed our allegiance to Christ, we've experienced his forgiveness And we walk on in Christ. He is the one who we want to identify with. It's not who we are is a result of whose we are. An internal character then will always be able to walk over external circumstances. That's why Paul can say, look, I'm not really in need. I don't sense myself as being in need, even though my external circumstances can be very, very difficult right now. Internal character can always triumph over external circumstances, whether your circumstances are really poor or whether they're really good. That is what contentment is. Where we're at because of whose we are helps us to say, you know what? I'm really in a state where there is sufficiency. I really feel like I can be independent of my external circumstances. I mean, a slap still hurts, but I can still stand. And here, I think, is one of the big takeaways that many times we have to understand. This issue of identity, this issue of contentment, it is something that Paul himself said, I had to learn this. At the moment of salvation, contentment does not arrive. This is a process. And so if you struggle with times of discontentment, relax. It is a process that needs to be learned. How many of you, when you start out on an exercise program, it's like, how come I am not 20 pounds lighter, benching 500 pounds more, or running that four-minute mile. You're learning. If those are your goals, I don't think you'll make it anyway. But you're in the process of learning. Paul said, I had to learn these things. And God uses life lessons to help us to learn those. So if, if not content... If we're not going to focus on being content, like Paul says, look, I've learned to be content. Well, if not content, well, then what? Well, how about discontent? Not an easy connection there. You see, we can be discontent in an abundance. We can be discontent sitting in luxury. We can be discontent sitting in a place of 
um, let's say, position of power, authority, much. We can be discontent there. And what can happen is that when we're discontent, because looking at our external circumstances, it's like, this is still not enough to satisfy me. It leads to contempt. We start looking upon others as less than ourselves. We become extremely arrogant, and there becomes an extreme emptiness and aloneness that happens. We focus on the external circumstances, we focus on abundance, and our internal character is not enough to sustain that, and as a result, we become discontent. Dr. Stephen Berglis is a psychiatrist at the Harvard Medical School. He wrote a book a number of years ago called The Success Syndrome. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to look at, he said, we see people in our culture and society of great talent, really good skills and ability, and they start to rise in their place, in their, either in their business, um, in their industry, uh, in their profession, and they start rising, and then all of a sudden there's this incredible implosion personally. And he goes, why does that happen? And he started to draw this conclusion. He said, what happens when external circumstances even in abundance, start to outpunt our internal character. What happens when people start to pursue things and get abundance to the point where their internal character cannot sustain it and they start to implode? What does the implosion look like? He said, first of all, they become extremely arrogant. Contempt, haughtiness, they become arrogant. Start to think of, picture People's faces are starting to come to your mind, I can tell, okay? They become arrogant. The other thing is they become incredibly alone. They want no accountability. There's nobody who's going to tell them what's right or what's wrong. No one's going to hold them accountable for their decisions, and they become incredibly alone. They are surrounded by abundance. They are surrounded by people. They are surrounded by support staff, employees, um, their gang, whatever it is, they've got their people and yet they're incredibly alone. Extremely popular, but all alone. The other thing he said is they become in very adventurous risk-taking. By that he says that what happens is that their, their existing circumstances are not satisfying and so they need a rush and so they start going into very extreme adventurous risk-taking and then they... He said, almost all of them wind up in adultery. As the great prophet Dr. Phil would say, how's that working out for you? Now, I, I want us to make sure that we understand this is not just a problem for the secular society. This is not a problem for those who are the secular humanists. Because in the last 20 to 30 years, how many of you were thinking of certain famous mega pastors who all of a sudden started to rise in their popularity, rise in their book deals, rise in their internet podcasts, rise in their popularity, and their internal character was not able to sustain it, and they became extremely arrogant. They had no accountability. They started with all sorts of adventurous risk-taking, and they wound up in adultery, and they imploded. See, this is a human phenomenon, and if the internal character is not sustaining the external circumstances, a whole lot of stuff will hit the fan. It can also happen in our, uh, if we're in a season of need or want. We can be discontent with that as well. We cannot have much, and we can be discontent with that because, our, again, our internal character is not strong enough to handle the trial, the struggle, the adversity, the lack that we're going through right now. And as a result, we can fall into certain uh, situations that are not good. We can become extremely passive. We can become apathetic. Where all of a sudden it's like, look, my situation, um, I'm in a state of want or need, I'm hungry, I've, it's just not well, my circumstances are bad. And if your internal character is not going to be able to withstand those kind of situations, you'll eventually just want to give up. 
You'll fall into despair. Either state, whether abundance or whether it's want, in either state, it's a result of external circumstances consistently ruling over your internal character. This is a sign of weak internal character that can't stand up to the stresses of life. Is life stressful? <laughs> Go listen to Jason's sermon from last Sunday. Stress is getting off the charts. And we're indulging in activities that just make it more stressful. Yes, life is stressful. Can we have the internal character that will help us to be sustained through that? Christ in us. That is the internal strength where we can say, I am satisfied. It doesn't mean I have to stay here but I am content in this earthly state that I find myself in. Discontentment, it's not a place of strength. Discontentment is not a place of being courageous. It's not a place of stability. And yet, discontentment seems to be very normal because there are all sorts of breakdowns and failures going on. Um, I like when I, when I put together a message, whether it's for church or whether it's for business groups or whatever it is, I love, I love to camp on words. Oh, really, Greg? Never picked that out before. Anyway, satisfaction. The word satisfaction is decreasing in the American vocabulary ever since the year 2000, rapidly decreasing in its use. Want to take a shot as to why? Why is the word satisfaction rapidly decreasing in our language, in our culture, for the last 22 years? Because we're not satisfied. <laughs> we don't experience, therefore we don't talk about it. We don't write about it. Satisfaction is on the decrease. And let me tell you, you want to stand out in a culture of dissatisfied people, be content. The secret for being content is Christ. That's it. Inner character has got to come from someone stronger than ourselves to build ourselves deeper, stronger, and braver. And that is Christ within us. Paul goes on, he goes, look, I know how to get along with a little I know how to live in prosperity in every or any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. He goes, I've been in abundance. I, I've been without. I've, I've, I've gone to the buffet. I've been hungry. I've, I've slept in a warm bed. I've been cold out on the street. Paul's, Paul's experienced it all. But he said, you know what? In all of these circumstances, he goes, I've learned a secret. There's a secret. There's a secret of being able to go through this. I like the Greek word which says it's a mystery. It's a mystery that has a right of initiation. The secret of contented living. Greg, what's the secret? What's the secret? Well, if I, if I was on um, TBN, I'd ask you to donate a faith love pledge and I'd send it to you, but we're not going to do that, all right? Because I'm content. What can I say? What's the secret? Okay, yeah, we're in church. It's Christ. Paul says, look, here's the secret. And the word secret here means it's an open secret. It means it's, it's available for anyone who wants to know what the secret is. It's not something to be hidden so that no one else knows. This is an open secret. It used to be not disclosed, but now it is. The tomb is empty. 
Christ is risen. We can have new life in Christ. And as a result, we can find an inner peace, an inner strength, and an inner contentment so that whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whether it's in a little bit or whether it's in a lot, whatever we find ourselves in, there is an inner character, an inner strength that is able to rise above so that, as we go back to the beginning of the service, we can look for opportunities. We're not looking at our circumstances continually saying, please change, please get better, please help me. But whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, we say, I find a great level of satisfaction, so God, send me an opportunity. I mean, who doesn't want a piece of that? Paul had told them earlier, he goes, look, the things that you have learned and received, heard and seen from me, practice these things. This is what practice looks like. Because the Philippians, he goes, you know, you practice these things. And he's, he's really, he's grading their paper and go, you get an A on it. This is, you guys are doing it. This is what it looks like. He goes, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my difficulty. You yourselves know, Philippians, that the first preaching of the gospel after I left from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. See, Paul's not saying, hey, man, put on the rose-colored glasses, man, and pretend it's all good. He goes, look, um, no, um, I'm in a place of difficulty, but in that place of difficulty, he's got the opportunity. He's sharing, he's giving, he's speaking, he's teaching. He goes, no one shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. I mean, how many churches did Paul go and plant and, and uh, build up and establish and then move on? And he said, right now at this point, he goes, none of them, you know, shared with me. You guys did. In fact, he goes, twice, he goes, for even in Thessalonica, you sent, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. He goes, not that I seek the gift in itself, contentment, I seek the profit which increases to your account. I've received everything in full. I have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing unto God. I hope you guys aren't offended by this. I don't mean it by sin, but some of you guys smell. Some of the guys are checking their armpits. Really, do I? No, it's all right. He said, what you have done by giving to me, you took this opportunity, you embraced it, and you did something. You were just, you're not just concerned, but you had an opportunity. He goes, he goes, that is something that God looks upon. He goes, that is a fragrant aroma. This is a look back into the Old Testament, the Levitical sacrificial system, that when they had a burnt offering in the temple, they would throw um, a certain incense on it so that when the smoke would come up, all of the city, because the temple was in the middle, all the city would be able to not only see the smoke, but there would be this peculiar aroma. This incense, the recipe for the incense um, was secret, you couldn't, um, you, know, you couldn't duplicate it and sell it on eBay. It was for the priests themselves. And it wasn't, you know, who likes the smell of burning bull flesh? Okay? But this incense would be thrown onto it and would have this peculiar aroma that was pleasing to know that there are sacrifices that in the, the, to the sensory portions of God, it's like, this is fragrant. This was something good. Look, you don't have to just give money to the missionaries to have a fragrant aroma that's pleasing to God. There are opportunities, there are people out there, there are situations, there are problems that need solutions. There are people that are struggling in this hopeless, helpless cycle of discontentment and dissatisfaction because the things that they are really, really longing for deep inside, the human need, the world cannot satisfy. It can cover, it can placate, but it really cannot satisfy. 
things like affection, intimacy, forgiveness, acceptance, purpose, significance, and security. Those come from a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And there are ample opportunities wherever we go to be able to say, I want to be a solution to the problem. I want to be an answer to the prayer. I want to be used. I want an opportunity, Lord, because I really want to embrace full contact Christianity. There are times when I will um, have the opportunity to meet with other businessmen. When I ask them about life plans, life goals, life callings, here's one of the answers that really gets my toes to curl, but I totally understand. But I say, Greg, I can't wait until I retire because then I will really get the chance to serve the Lord. And my answer is like, my gosh, I hope... I hope nobody else has that opinion that you have. And now that I've got their attention, they go, well, why is that? Because if everyone in business had this idea that they have to wait till they retire to be really serving the Lord, then no one is serving in business. Parents, when you say, you know what, when the kids get older and they move out, they get, maybe they get older, they're going to go to school or whatever, then I'll really be able to serve the Lord. Same thing. If that is true with everyone, then who is serving the children? Where is Christ being manifested in the home? Students. Got some students here? Boy, I can't wait till I get out of school. I get a real job. Stop living off of ramen. Stop getting that fifth roommate into my 400 square foot apartment so we can have $25 less a month to pay on the rent. I can't wait. Then I'm going to serve God. So I hope that's not true. Because then who's serving Christ on the campus? Who's serving Christ to all the other ramen-eating, cramped, quartered students that are up to their nose and above with student debt and wondering, why is this not satisfying? Why is this not satisfying? See, the thing is, is that the reason why a sovereign God has you right where you are right now today is because there are opportunities right there that he wants to use you to be a solution to. He wants to use you right there in those situations. So don't look for the, when is grass greener on the other side of the fence? Sometimes it's just another shade of brown, okay? God wants to use you right here, right where you're at right now. Paul Wine ends this and he goes, he said, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. He's letting them know. They gave to him. He goes, look, he's going to supply all your needs according to who he is. That is contentment. That is contentment. And it's contentment whether you have a little or it's contentment whether you have a lot. And sometimes people, they, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around, how can I be discontent with a lot? Let me ask you, if you all of a sudden had a lot, do you have a plan for it? Do you have a plan for it? So, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what I would do with it. Maybe that's why God has not put it in your lap right now. So what should I do? Work on your internal character. You mean I'll win the lottery? I'm not going there. I'm not on TBN, okay? Let me ask you this. Does money corrupt? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Now that I got your attention, good. No, it doesn't. Money does not corrupt, but money reveals. When you look in the scripture, abundance, treasure, riches are not seen as anything inherently good or inherently evil, but it is inherently a revealer. When someone all of a sudden gets a hold of abundance and they go, gosh, they won the lottery and their life just went away, man, it corrupted them. It's like, no, what it did is it revealed the corruption that was already there. It reveals the corruption that's already there. So it's not an issue of abundance or want. 
It's an, it's an issue of our character. It's the issue of what we are paying attention to. What we hear, what we see, what we're learning, and who are we receiving it from. And he ends with this prayer. He goes, now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What does amen really mean? For some of us, it means time to eat, right? Sometimes it means, okay, we're going to pray about something, we're concerned about something, and then we're going to pray about it, and it's like, okay, we're all, amen, we're all done here. I think sometimes that's the, that's the picture we got. Amen, we're all done here. Moving on. Amen comes from a Greek and a Hebrew word that says, so it is. May it be fulfilled, and so be it. If we're to paraphrase it, amen means it's when the praying ends, and it's the looking for opportunity begins. I think it would benefit us at times that when we have a concern, remember that we said, what are you concerned about? What are you praying about? How about if we pray for an opportunity? Lord, show me an opportunity today. How can I be a solution to whatever I'm praying? We can't be the solution to everything. But what if, what if we would start, or we would end prayers and say, Lord, and show me, or give me, or grant me, or open my eyes to an opportunity on this day? I wonder what would happen. I wonder what would happen that maybe our concerns that are turned to prayers, that when we pray for opportunity, that we would end it, and instead of saying amen, we say, Lord, now what? And to look expectantly to what Lord wants to do in your life, in the community where we find ourselves. So in that, why don't we go ahead and pray? Father, we... We've read a lot, we've talked a lot, we've received a lot. We just asked that um, this issue, that we would find Christ in us, our character, the inner man being built up, becoming stronger. We live in a world that is so discontent, so dissatisfied because circumstance, it's a broken world. And man isn't gonna fix it. You will one day. Until then, Lord, there are problems that, we want to be solutions to. And there are people that are struggling and hurting and they need to know about who you are, the source of inner strength, inner courage, inner forgiveness, a new nature, and contentment. Our circumstances, Lord, they may change, but may you continue to grow. And so we ask this, Lord, for opportunities and we ask it in your name, and we also ask, now what?